All right. Hello and welcome back, everybody, to the latest episode of the podcast. Today, we have a father, a husband, a Halo content creator, and a Twitch streamer. He's bringing the positive vibes all day long. Today, we have Crazy Miller here on the podcast. Super excited to chat with him, get an overview of his story, how he got into the content creation side of things. Also, the first human being that I can talk to face-to-face about the recent Halo Infinite flight and get his opinion and bounce off some ideas as well. So, so happy to have you on the podcast, man. Thanks for making the time. Hey, absolutely. Happy to be here, man. I've been, uh, like I said, watching some of your podcasts and stuff, checking it out and uh, very excited to be here and chat about content creation, Halo and everything. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I jumped in your stream the other day. We played a few games together and it was a great opportunity for me to get a better understanding of like how what you do is like your community. And I love it because, you know, talking to all of the content creators in the Halo scene at the moment, I'm getting a really good feeling for what is important to different people. And Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has their own slight little spin on their community and like how they're doing it, like how they're building their community. And I I really loved the positive vibes around yours. And it was so easy just to jump in and play some games with you the other day. So yeah, it's really awesome to to chat. Um, before we start though, for anyone that's watching this and that's interested, if you don't know anything about Crazy Miller, in the description to the video right now, uh, or if you're listening to it as a podcast, there'll be links to all of his content. So you can click through, find all that stuff and interact with him uh, yourself. I'd highly recommend it. Like I said, he's a, he's a super chill dude. And, you know, you'll obviously hear more while we're talking today on the podcast, but uh, you can go sure. see it yourself also. All right. Um, So to get us started, we're going to do a bit of a speed round, all right? So I'm just going to ask you, I think it's like about six questions uh, that are just like, you know, one or two word word answers. And uh, and then after that, I'm just going to say a word and I want you the first thing that comes to your head. But first of all, what's your favorite color? Blue. And your favorite Halo weapon ever? Ooh, the sniper rifle. Yeah, I think that's a good (laughs) (laughs) one. Okay, if you could only ever pick up one of them, Overshield or Invis? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, Invis. I like to make the sneaky plays. Sneaky plays, yeah. Uh, your favorite Halo? Ooh. Present time, it's Halo 5, just because I'm enjoying it so much. But uh, during its during its peak, probably Halo 2 or Halo 3, just because I absolutely loved playing both of those. Yeah, so. yeah. No, well, that makes sense. You're a normal human being then. So uh, favorite map <laughs> of all time? Oh my goodness, that's like the toughest question ever. Um, of all time, oh, dude, how did you put this in a speed round? This is way too tough. I know, I know. Well, if you had to think of, uh, you know, maybe one that you played the most uh, in custom games, maybe. I'd probably say maybe Guardian on Halo 3. Yeah. Played that so much. Yeah. Guardian, Guardian and the Pit are definitely my most played maps ever. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> most just, played without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think they'd be, I think they'd be up there with favorite. But I do. Ins- I'm starting to enjoy some of the Halo Five maps as well, which I didn't write at the start of Halo Five, but mm-hmm. there's a few in there now that I really like. Like I actually really like Plaza. I just love the the amount of movement opportunity there is on Plaza. Really, like it took me a yeah. while. So. All the jumps and everything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Go to fast food um fast food place or just like what to order from fast food either both either okay so chick-fil-a out here in the united states is so good Mm. i uh i'm a huge crispy chicken fan so anything crispy chicken i'm all about it so awesome and what what's your go-to order from chick-fil-a uh just getting their uh crispy chicken sandwich with fries Yum. And because it's got the Chick-fil-A sauce on it and the Chick-fil-A sauce is so good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, okay. And this one is, uh, this is going to be telling of the, how the rest of the podcast is going to go dogs or cats. Uh, cats. Oh, <laughs> I, I knew that as well before I started. <laughs> I've got a, I've got a, a dog back in Australia. I miss him so much, uh, but yeah. never had a cat. So <laughs> yeah, see I'm, I'm the opposite. I've always had cats in my life. So I've just kind of grown up with cats. I've never actually had a dog. So yeah. I do like dogs. I'm an animal lover. So I absolutely love hanging out with animals and stuff. So yeah, uh, eventually we may get a dog, but I'm not sure. So. Yeah. I don't know. I like because I, I can't tell because I've never had a cat, but I've like, you know, friends, grown up with friends that have had cats. I feel like cats are just so much more their own, like independent 
person or you know animal oh, yeah they whereas, are whereas dogs are super like i love you and i need your attention and like right. i, I want to please you and make you happy and i and, and they're so loyal you know so right yeah so cats will let you know when they want attention it's all about when they want attention but yeah my one cat reese he's he's huge but um he doesn't it doesn't matter when you come up and show him attention like he's all about it my other cat will like run away from you yeah <laughs> so i have two cats and uh all like my my twitch like emotes and stuff are based on cats so <laughs> yeah yeah i love that. big cat fan so yeah all right so i'm gonna say a one word and then you just tell me the first thing that comes to your mind okay uh, In- <laughs> yeah halo br halo yeah <laughs> crazy <laughs> miller <laughs> <laughs> lifestyle um i'm not sure Ooh. What, what was the first thing that came to your head was it literally like i don't uh, know yeah like i don't know like lifestyle what like how you're actually living your life or like someone else's like actual lifestyle like your lifestyle first thing that comes to my, my life lifestyle is- super chill <laughs> chill yeah uh mm-hmm. and fitness fitness uh exercising feeling good yeah cool yeah. awesome well it's good because uh, i wanted to add that in there at the start of like most of our uh podcasts now just so that everybody that listens can kind of be like all right now we feel like we know crazy Miller a little bit better right without having to listen yeah. to the rest of the hour but don't don't not listen to the rest of the hour so um <laughs> right what i like to do is kind of start with how did you get into gaming so when I was about four years old, uh, my parent my parents got a Nintendo 64. And so got a Nintendo 64 and um, Super Mario. So that's where it all started was Super Mario on the Nintendo 64. Um, so they had, it was like, uh, they had their own business. And every time they spent money on a certain credit card, they got a certain amount back. Mm-hmm. So they would just get us video games every time they would get money back from those cards. Oh, so, yeah. So we ended up stocking up a ton of video games. And so I was always playing Nintendo 64, like GoldenEye, Perfect Dark. Yeah. Um, like I said, Mario, Super Smash, all that good fun stuff on the 64. So yeah. the 64 was like so critical to the evolution of games. Like, that Mario game you're talking about, the one dropping, jumping the picture frames and everything like that. Yep. Man, yeah. that is just such a revolutionary game. I, that was one of my favorite games of all time, for sure. But it's yeah. so funny how uh, Nintendo is like a lot of people's first kind of console getting into it. Um, oh, without a doubt, like yeah. Goldeneye, man. Like, Goldeneye was just, that game was just so incredible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really I was. I really wish that they could bring an element of that Goldeneye game back because I just, I loved it. I loved everything about it. Mm. Um, and then okay, so you Nintendo 64 was the first console. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, yep. As you kind of grew up and you were like really young, then you were like under 10. Did you, um, did you keep playing Nintendo the whole way and then had to stumble into playing more like first person shooter games and Halo? So, yeah, it was just the Nintendo 64 growing up all the way until Xbox came out. And then our next console was the Xbox. So I just played all Nintendo games and everything all the way up until Xbox came out. And the first game that we got with Xbox was Halo. Oh, okay. So from then it was just playing Halo constantly, you know? Yeah. And, and so did your parents get you the Xbox with Halo or is that like, is that, and that's the first time you experienced Halo as well? Yeah. So that was the first time I experienced Halo was the Xbox with Halo. And so it was straight from Nintendo to Xbox playing Halo on the Xbox. So it was like, I fell in love with it then. And it's literally just been Halo ever since. Yeah. That's, that's so funny though. Cause your Halo dealer is your parents. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And what I was, when did uh, the original Xbox came out? What in 2001? Yeah. Something like that. That's, I think that's when Halo uh, CE came out as well. So, yeah. So I was, like nine years old playing <laughs> playing halo <laughs> or rated m mature game but yeah. i mean it is what it is my brother uh my brother is four years older than me so i would always do like split screen stuff with him mm. and play with him and then uh 
it ended up like he would be playing with like his friends and they would have like a LAN. And so he would just have me tag along because I played the game and I would just like destroy all of them and they would get so mad at me because yeah. I would be beating them in a LAN. It was so it's, fun. Yeah, yeah, it's so fun. I, I Speaking of LANs, I'm, I haven't, I, the last one, the last LAN that I think I ever went to, and I'm talking about like just one with friends, like at, at one of our places, just crashing there. Uh, mm. it would have been like maybe three or four years ago now. And it's like, man, I can't wait for first of all COVID to be done. But then second of all, for us to have like Halo Infinite and it's going to hopefully bring back all these people who like just want to see, you know, is it, is it, do, can I get any of that nostalgia back <laughs> from playing? Oh, for sure. So. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the same for me too, is uh, it's been about that long and it's crazy to think about, but that's why I'm so excited for the next like actual land event that we can go to yeah. just to be able to see everyone again and give everyone hugs and say what's up you know yeah have you been to many lands like so competitions and stuff yeah i've been to a couple um i started going to lands in 2015 with uh halo 2 anniversary mm. so there was one in Columbus, I believe, that we went to, and I only went as a spectator just to see what it was like being at an actual like venue. Mm -hmm. And that was like the first time actually going to a venue and checking out a land. And I think that's the one where Pistola broke his hand from from getting angry and punching the setup. Oh wow! <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was I think late 2015, and then I went to ACS Indianapolis, and I actually like competed there and did horribly but <laughs> it is what it is yeah. uh so first land didn't go very well but it was still an awesome time got to meet a lot of super cool people and people that i had met through twitch and everything and then yeah i've just been to a couple other land events since then because you know there hasn't been a lot going on land event wise since you know there was a couple h5 ones that i went to like uh chattanooga that was a good one in Tennessee. And I didn't go to a ton of Halo 5 events. There was uh, Gamers Forgiving. Uh, fun fact about that, 2016 Gamers Forgiving happened, or didn't happen, if you will. Do you know what Gamers Forgiving is? No, give us the background on it. Uh, so Gamers Forgiving, they are a charity organization, and they throw a LAN event in Michigan every single year. And I believe it was 2016, they had the LAN event there. And I lived in Michigan at the time. Mm. Um, and everyone flew in, you know, from like Texas and like California and stuff. And they came to compete in the event. Well, they couldn't get the servers to work properly because you had to be connected to the internet. And the for some reason, they couldn't get it working inside the venue. Yeah, But like Call of Duty was working fine on PlayStation, but they couldn't get the Xboxes to work properly. Yeah, it was very frustrating. So then it was like Sunday rolled around and they still couldn't get it working. And so I told them like, listen, if you guys can't get it working, I live an hour away. I'm going to invite everyone over to my house and throw a my plan and have stuff that like live locally. And they were like, okay. So I uh, invited everyone out. I think I had over 40 some people show up at my house and play Halo in my basement. Yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty That's amazing. Fun, but did we not worry that there was just going to be a bunch of random people at your house? Or were you just like, they're all Halo players, so this will be fine? Yeah, they were all Halo players. I was like, listen, the Halo community is pretty awesome. Like, I'm going to invite everyone that I know personally. Yeah. And if they bring their friends that they trust, like, then it's all good. So, yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Nothing bad happened. Everyone was super cool. The cops showed up and they were like, uh, why are there so many cars here? And I was just like, uh, we're doing a Halo land. <laughs> and I explained the story to him. He's like, all right, well, you guys have fun. That's, that's <laughs> so funny. That's, that's going to be one of the first Halo lands to attract police attention ever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I know. It was pretty crazy. It was super fun, though. So what were you guys playing? Did you just set up like uh, custom games and just kind of have like lots of lots of custom games going or was it? Yeah, so we had uh, we had eight setups and then I had my stream PC set up. So I like brought everything to the basement and had everything set up. I put tables down and 
Uh, everyone set up their stuff. So like I had previously run some LAN events in my basement, like as it was just like yeah. Halo lands and stuff. So I had all the equipment and everything. And so I just threw everything together. And then, yeah, we just ran like 4v4 custom games, like like tournament style, essentially. And it was just, you know, whoever on a team. And so everyone got to play and it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's probably a better experience than if it had have just stayed at the venue, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, for me, yeah, it was actually an incredible experience and like, it was funny too. People were coming into my like Twitch stream and like Miller saved Halo. And like, it was funny. I was talking to Callus the other day and he brought it up again about how I saved Halo and all this other stuff. But I mean, I don't feel that way, but you know, it's, it's cool to hear people say that. <laughs> yeah, of course, man. That's so cool. All right. So if we go, if we go back to the timeline side of things, right, you've, you've got Halo one, you're kicking your brothers and their friends bums at it. Um, mm -hmm. What, when do you first get online? When do you get to first experience like actual multiplayer online? Uh, Halo 2. Yeah. Yep. And were you playing mainly social for Halo 2 or did you get into some of the ranked? Uh, I did ranked. Um, I got up into the legit 40s in ranked and then the modders took over all of Halo 2. So it's like every single game you're playing against somebody that's modding against you and i didn't know about like bridging standbying any of that stuff because i was too young and just didn't know yeah and so i didn't know how to like bridge hosts to make sure that i wouldn't get modded against or standby and all that good fun stuff so um i think i finished like ranked at like 38 or 37 yeah but yeah, it was like every game was just modders and standby and stuff like that. And it wasn't very fun, but <laughs> yeah. I still did it. Like I somebody just posted uh stats because they found it on the uh the waypoint stuff. Um I had over eight thousand over eight thousand matches in wow. Halo 2. Yeah. That's and cool. that's not counting like the countless hours that I just spent in custom games doing butterfly glitches and rocket sword glitches and all that good fun stuff super jumping well that's that's uh it's really interesting you say that because i'm sure there's a bunch of kids especially that are, that would watch this and have no idea what any of that was so but the, the, yeah. I want to, give, me the, give me the overview because i dealt with for the first time the modding and the bridging host and the you know all of that type of stuff in halo 3 but i didn't get into halo 3 until like 2009 uh, no, 2011, okay. I think. Um, so I came right in and that was at the point where it was literally just, it was happening rampant. It was, you could tell there were people lag switching. It was just all over the place. Mm. So when you're saying that you were dealing with people doing that, what is, what are they doing? So uh, bridging host just means that you are guaranteeing yourself host. And if you have hosts, you're able to, if you had like the mods and stuff on your Xbox, you could bridge yourself host and then mod in the game which means that I vividly remember turf was one of the maps in halo two and they would, the modder would be floating in the air and you would spawn in a designated spot and they would have a battle rifle that just shoots sniper rifle, sniper rifle bullets. And so you would just get spawn sniped instantly. Like you had no chance at doing anything. Yeah. And that's, that was like the lobbies. Like that was what was happening and ranked, you know? Yeah. We'll see that. And it's good. I think we went over that because I think so many people would be just like, oh, yeah, so what? They got a host. I can still play the game or whatever. It's like, no, it was like game breaking. It was so yeah. bad. Yeah, and, without a doubt. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then when you're in the custom games and you're doing like the, uh, the you know, the sword flying and all that type of stuff, what are those things? Because Halo 2 had some amazing mechanics for doing that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So pretty much what you could do is like you could like rocket sword glitch and your character would fly from where you're standing to the player that you're looking at. So you could just like pretty much launch yourself at them. And then also the sword cancel, like butterfly glitch was like, you could stand in a corner and then um, have somebody jump on your head. And then you could just like sword cancel off of them and it would push them up. So there was a map that there was a gigantic crane way up in the sky that you could see. And 
you could just like do the sword cancel butterfly glitch all the way up to the top of like a building and then walk to a certain spot and then you could do it and go higher and you could eventually get up to that crane yeah. that was like way up in the sky it looked like you could never get there yeah but with utilizing those mechanics you could get up there <laughs> with doing all that stuff it was so cool game is hey like who the people had thought of that for the first time and then made it accessible so that everybody else like you know what we can do this now as well <laughs> We're gonna do mm -hmm. this but I, I feel like stuff like that is just like discovered on accident and they're like, oh, wait, how do I replicate that? And then they figure it out and then it just goes word of mouth from there and everyone just finds out about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, back then it would have been right because there's not as there wasn't as many forums and like YouTube wasn't as big. And yeah. you know, like, there was no people couldn't just type in like Halo 2 glitches and all of this like, you know, information comes up. <laughs> right. Word of mouth. You had to see someone doing it and then be in a custom game with it. And you know, that was the same for like trick jumps and stuff in, in Halo 3 as well, I remember. Like there, in Halo, um, when I was playing Halo 3, there was a few people that were doing things like that, but um, like Saleya, I don't know if you remember Saleya, he was really big in Halo 3 and Reach. And he would just put out these montages of like really distinctive different movement that you'd never seen anyone else do. And he'd hit clips from different places on the maps. Um, but he, mm -hmm. never put, he never put out videos from like, how he got to those locations or anything like that and made it like, oh, wow. special. Whereas like these days you see one person get there and then someone is like, nah, I figured it out. <laughs> you know, like right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Did the the word of mouth thing too is so funny because I always think about the same map that I was talking about with the uh getting on top of the crane. There was a a sign with the golden warhog on it. And ever like everyone just spread rumors that you could get that golden warhog and they spread rumors about how to get it and where to get it. And I spent so many hours trying to do what people were saying to yeah. try and get the, the golden warhog. And it just wasn't possible. And yeah. just I spent so many hours trying to get that. And it was just a rumor. Yeah, it was the golden goose, but the golden warthog. <laughs> trying to get yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So then uh, Halo 3 comes out and you said like before Halo 2 and Halo 3 were like your, your you know, what well, two of your favorite Halos. Um, mm. What did you enjoy about Halo 3 that Halo 2 didn't really have? Uh, well, for me, it was, uh, it was more so the competitive thing because, you know, I spent so many hours and so much time trying to get to a 50 in Halo 2 mm. and I never could because of cheaters in the game. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, Halo 3, I put in, you know, tons of hours and everything into that game as well. And I was able to actually get my 50s in that game. And in that game, it was such a like cool accomplishment because you'd get the general um, badge yeah. instead of like Brigadier General. Because you'd have people that were like Brigadier General that couldn't get their 50s, but they had tons of experience in the game. Yeah. And then if you actually got your 50, you got the general thing, which was super cool. So, yeah yeah trust me i i remember that because it's like in australia obviously we the connection's not that great so getting a 50 is like even harder because you're doing it on like three bar right like right yeah exactly 90 percent of the games so i remember um we'd finished school and so it's like first year out of school and uh a bunch of my mates got me into halo i'm playing it i'm like how in the world are these people so good right and at that point i didn't even realize that i was at a disadvantage and i didn't even realize i was playing against people on the other side of the world and whatever um <laughs> right but, but you know so i was such a big noob and then um i was like there's no way that anyone in australia has a 50 like that was how i was thinking right and then one of my yeah. best mates now and actually my business partner fred for divine mind he was the first 50 i ever met all right and uh, he, uh, oh, was, wow. he, he, yeah, cool. he was a, a hardcore, like Halo 3, really, really, really talented player, right? And uh, I remember thinking as soon as, I, as soon as I spoke to him and he said he was a 50, I was like, nah, whatever. We played together and he was definitely a 50. And I was like, <laughs> okay. you know, I, that, that's the type of stuff that I loved about Halo, right? It's just mm -hmm. like around every corner, no matter where you are in the world, there was something else you could learn, someone else that was better than you, you know? And like Fred taught me so many things that made me a better Halo player. And, uh, you know, and obviously when we're, we're now, you know, uh, working together on, in a business that's all about Halo. So yeah. it's, uh, it's crazy how Halo like brings people together and does all that type of stuff. But- uh, Yeah, absolutely. It's amazing. <laughs> it seriously is. And so, okay, Halo 3, you got, what was the first 50 in that you got? Uh, MLG, 
just because that's yeah that's the only thing that i played was just the mlg playlist because i wanted to be like really 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 good you know yeah and so that's all i was grinding <laughs> so if you had to think about how you're how good you are at Halo five right now and how good you were at Halo three at your peak which game do you think you were better at um i would probably say halo 3 just because right now i don't like have the drive to be the best yeah. you know and, like halo 5 there's still so much that i could do and implement in my gameplay that i just don't because halo 5's at the end of its life and i'm not going to be competing in halo 5 so i'm kind of just like there's not really a point you know yeah so definitely halo 3 honestly i'm i'm really bummed out that i didn't start competing during halo 2 i yeah. feel like i could have you know excelled really well back in halo 2 because i did go to a, a halo 3 event it was a gamers forgiving event it was a 2v2 and i just went with a buddy from school and i was like playing really well against the players that were there yeah and I feel like I could have like done really well competing and stuff. Like it was so much fun. And I wish that I was like in the atmosphere because, you know, everyone looks back at like the MLG days and everything. Yeah. And it just stinks that I wasn't there, you know? Yeah. 100%. <laughs> I remember watching like the ESPN top 10 and like with, with Chris Puckett and, you know, mm -hmm. that's, I saw that on TV before I saw it on the internet. Right. Wow. And like, That's I remember, awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I remember those were just like some memories that I have of being like, man, I wish I could be at an event. You know, right. I bought an MLG hoodie for me, my brother, one of my best mates, and his brother. And we would, we would all, you know, watch the MLG uh, competitions and all of the pro players from back in the day and all the trash talk montages. <laughs> I just remember thinking, man, I can't wait until like it's, a, it's accessible for me to go and be a part of that. Right. Right. And, uh, so, I, and I'm still looking forward to it. Have another opportunity. So, hopefully, uh, we get this one at the end of the year for Halo Infinite. Uh, yeah. Will you be going to that dragon? Oh yeah. I uh, I I plan on trying to be a part of every single Halo event, like going forward. Like I want to be there for sure. Awesome. And do you think do you think you'll because obviously what you're doing like mainly now is focusing on like your content creation with your streaming and like your YouTube and and that type of thing do you think that you'll try and compete and like actually play in a team against other really you know competitive players for halo infinite so that's kind of uh it's kind of like up in the air at the moment just because like with my current schedule and everything i don't really get much time to play at night yeah. so competing would be really difficult just based on my current play time, I like play in the morning. So not many people are playing in the morning and yada, yada. Yeah. So like usually scrims and stuff happen at night. So I would love to compete, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like, I think I'm going to compete regardless, but I don't think I'm going to like be competing to like 100% win. It'll be more for like fun and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's what I did for halo five too, is like I teamed with my younger brother. He's, well, my younger brother-in-law, he's 10 years younger than me. And I wanted to take him to his first event, you know, because I think back, like, I wish that I went to that. So yeah. I wanted to take him there. And so I teamed with him for like all my Halo 5 events pretty much because I wanted him to experience it, you know. So yeah. uh, I was just going for fun, you know, and I, I might just do that for this as well. And like to just meet people, all the people in the Halo community that like, you know, the common interest thing, just everyone there is there for Halo and they love Halo. So, you know, getting to talk to like-minded people at an event is just, it's it's a good time. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, I can't wait as well. Like uh, I keep saying this on every podcast, but like I've started saving money so that I can buy everybody that I've had on the podcast a beer <laughs> and just, just hang out, <laughs> hear out for coffee. Yeah. Be like, hey, and just meet everybody in real life because I think it's, so awesome to be able to make all these friends that you know mm -hmm. uh, you're just talking to online and then we get to a place where we're all gonna get to meet each other for the like for a lot of us for the first time or like you know and uh i think that's the type of thing that kind of really solidifies that that friendship and uh yeah i can't, sure. I can't wait to i'm so i'm mm -hmm. so excited for whenever for the I, I think they said at the end of the year they haven't had like lockdown anything yet but i think that as soon as we as soon as infinite launches there'll be uh, a 
program of events kind of thing, like a schedule for the competitive season. Um, mm. And that's like what we were talking before we started. Like that's where Divine Mind's big focus is going to be with having an Australian team compete. Um, and we need that schedule because I want to make sure that we can have some of these players come over and practice in America, um, yeah. you know, before the event. Because the last time they came, we had uh, Australians at the World Championships, they arrived a day before the event started. <laughs> And so, wow. so they're all, they were all just so tired and jet lagged and, you know, they had Absolutely. Bad, broken controllers and stuff. And so we want to give these guys like a real opportunity to fully compete because we've got some really good Halo players in Australia, you know, yeah. and I'd love, for, I'd love for the rest of the world to get to see that as well. But, uh, and I get to meet you at an event. That'd be nice. Absolutely. <laughs> and say Heck hi. Yeah, I'll be there, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So thoughts on the, the Halo Infinite uh, flight that we just had um with you know we'll try and keep this to maybe maybe 15 20 minutes because <laughs> i'm sure we can okay. go on about it but what were you happy with everything that you got to experience in the bot slayer and like the two hours of, of pvp so i'm just gonna backtrack just a little bit on your previous statement on uh the roadmap they did state like earlier on that they were going to be pushing out an entire roadmap which i'm like hoping so much that they do that like with what you said like i'd like to plan all these trips yeah and you know get like airbnbs and like get you know ready and prepared for all of these but uh yeah because like i said i plan on going to all of them as well like as many of them as i possibly can yeah but yeah the uh the halo infinite like bot slayer and stuff was a lot of fun um i was expecting a little bit more um like difficulty with the bots because you know i play halo 5 right now and halo 5's firefight like if you mm. do mythic firefight you get absolutely owned by like um the prometheans and the covenant and stuff yeah. so i was expecting like more like more difficulty but at the same time when they did the um the interview or whatever and they were talking about the bots they were saying that the highest um bots are like platinum players mm. And that kind of like threw me for a spin, which, you know, after playing it, I guess, yeah, they would be more in line with like platinum players. Yeah. But I think if they iron out like the kinks with uh, the bots, like looking at the sky or looking straight at the ground and like spinning and stuff. Yeah. I think that, you know, if they, you know, pay attention to players and stuff more then they would be a lot harder. Yeah. But the grenades on them are insane. Like that's what I, I died ridiculous. by the most. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh, yeah, no, that's so interesting. You said that. Cause I think what I remember them saying as well is it's one of the easier um, bot levels originally. And then they kind of put in these platinum bots, but you're right. There was a few things in there, which obviously that's what they wanted to do this for and see how it works. But uh, right. I think that anytime I ever saw the bots, like not paying attention, kind of like spinning around or like looking at the ground or like, it, you know, you're like, okay, they're stuck. Like they've glitched a little bit. It was generally around like an objective. So like, mm -hmm. um, I noticed a lot with Overshield. I can't remember the, the name of the map, but Overshield. It's on live front. fire. Yeah. Yeah. And they were in front of Overshield, like almost. Yeah. They would just jump up and down. And yeah. And, like they didn't spin. know how to get it. So they like, yeah. they should be getting it, but they were just kind of like <laughs> stuck in front of it. So I think that uh -huh. makes it easier for them to be able to put two and two together and be like, okay, so they're like, you know, the input for the, for them wasn't, there wasn't enough input capability for them to be able to get to where they needed to be, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I found like the assault rifle itself was like, I don't know. How did you feel about that? Because a lot of people have been talking about that. Yeah, everyone's been talking about that because it takes 12 bullets to break shields with the assault rifle. Yeah. And then... If you get two headshots after the shields are broken, yeah, it's, that you yeah. can kill somebody. So you can kill somebody in 14 shots, or if you, you know you break shields in 12 and then you get five body shots with it, then they die. Yeah. So 17 shots out of I think it was like a 36 round clip or something. Yeah, you can you can mow people down with that thing and it kills fast. And some people were doing like time to kill videos. You can kill faster with the AR than you can with like the battle rifle and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, yeah. I think it's a little too, too crazy. I think they need to tune it back just a little bit, but yeah. that's more of the competitive me speaking. Yeah. Um, because, you know, obviously I would like to have battle rifles as main start again, coming from 
you know, Halo two and three, but that's the competitive kid in me. I know there's a lot of people that are like, um, telling the the competitive people to quiet down and that the AR should now be the main power or the main weapon. And yeah, I, I don't like that, but yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, like, there's a lot of talk around the AR right now. Yeah. <laughs> crazy. yeah for sure. You know, I always think that, um, I think like one of the things that makes AR too powerful as well is that it didn't get de-scoped from like the smart, smart link. So, so like, you know, you could be fighting somebody that's at BR applicable range, right? And those yeah. two headshot bullets after their shields pops still so it's so easy to get, right? And it's an mm-hmm. automatic weapon. So like, even if it's like the time that it takes you to shoot those maybe six bullets is like the same time that it might take you to shoot two accurate headshots. You know what I mean? Like, so I, I just think that that could be one element of it. And the other one is like, do we really want to, do we really need to go back to trying to have a, um, an automatic meta in competitive, like Halo, Halo five, man, that's literally what, what killed, <laughs> killed the game at the beginning is that we had people exactly automatic weapons. Like there's no, there's no way that three, four, three will make that mistake again, but it's interesting that there are so many people that have got their opinions still and can't right. just like, look, like look back and be like, okay, that didn't work. Like that didn't, doesn't work. Is it, yeah. You know? I, and, and I don't know if they just don't understand that, that like that's literally what killed Halo 5 was the fact that it was AR starts for the longest time before they figured out, oh, it should just be, you know, pistol starts or whatever. And then they didn't even like get all the rest of the settings right. So I don't know. It was Halo 5 was a mess. And I don't know if you saw Snipe Down talk about it. But he did say that Halo 5 was or could have been the greatest um, Halo game mm. if they actually fixed and like took care of like competitive settings and stuff like that. For sure. And, and <laughs> uh, like another thing, though, that really they would what that needed to change would have been the, um, the heavy aim. Like heavy aim was something yeah. that, that people noticed and talked about. And it just never like it didn't get the attention that it needed. But you get you remove heavy aim. You pay attention to competitive settings and you have inbuilt a competitive like um, series or roadmap that gets people wanting to watch and compete in Halo again. And then it flows down. Right. And I, I think mm. I think that that mixed with like the battle pass that we've got and a few other things for Halo Infinite has me really excited that we're going to have a lot of people come over and they want maybe oh, something sure. a bit more challenging than playing Call of Duty where it's, you know, the time to kill is so slow and there's, you know, they've got that. It's, it's almost like Call of Duty's like really oversaturated themselves with the amount of stuff that they've got going on at the moment. And I think Halo will, will give people that opportunity to be like, okay, this is like an actual competitive arena still. And like here are the elements that we're going to take care of. And as long as the, um, 343 maintains the transparency and like when they're communicating with the audience saying, okay, we can hear what you guys are saying about this and this, we're going to implement this is a hot fix and try it and engage how it works, but we need the feedback on how that works. Like, you know, I think that's super key to making sure that it works. What do you reckon? Yeah. I mean, I agree completely. And I hope that, you know, they actually listen to competitive players and don't pull competitive settings from people that don't play competitive, you know, like the whole AR thing. It's like, if they listen to the people that aren't competing that are like vouching for ARs, Mm. then they'll bring ARs back in and then they'll, um, you know, ruin the game like Halo five. So it's like, they have to be talking to and communicating with the right people and people that are actually competing and stuff like that. And then uh, with the, the heavy aim, it's funny that you bring that up because the, how did you like the aiming in Halo infinite? Could you tell much or? Look, I found like it was definitely the sniper I found very difficult and that comes from someone oh, for like, sure. I, I love sniping. And uh, mm-hmm. when I kind of compare it between the two games or three games that I've played the most, so Reach, Halo 3 and Halo 5, each of those games have a slight difference to how sniping works. Like Halo 3, you can kind of whip your shots more and like quick scoping and, and two body mm-hmm. shots is, is like a, a, an entire meta for Halo 3 sniping. Whereas Reach, it, it's the, it's a headshot. You've got a, like a higher, a, a larger hitbox for the, for the headshot and Reach. So it's more about right. like trying to hit that accurate headshot. And then Halo 5, you've got so much more that you can do with no scoping and everything like that. And you kind of can get into the feel for each of those games sniping. In the, in the time that I got to use the sniper in Halo 5, it just didn't, so in, in Halo Infinite, 
it didn't feel like I could pick up on how I'm meant to be using it. If that makes it makes sense. You know, right. Like I said, you know, if it was Halo three sniping, I know I can kind of whip my shots a bit and, and I can snipe really well with that. Um, but yeah, just it, that felt off the Magnum. I just couldn't put down. It felt like there was an area of randomness to like the, the sidearm where I was like, okay, I feel like all those shots are in the right spot. I feel like I was, mm-hmm. you know, I feel like they should have been hitting, but I, I didn't get the kill and I died. Right. Like, so there was some elements of that, that I felt same with, um, there was a few, few aim things that I noticed with weapons that I was kind of a little bit curious about. I gave my feedback on it as well, but yeah. Yeah. What did um, you- so like the uh my main thing is I-, I saw a video on it people were talking about dead zones and stuff like that so i put all my dead zones to zero in halo infinite and on halo 5 i don't get any kind of drift or anything with my controller um mcc though if i put my dead zones at zero yeah. i do get a slight drift and i noticed in halo infinite you know putting my dead zones at zero yeah. And then trying to micro adjust just like a little bit on the thumbstick still yeah. wasn't um, wasn't giving feedback to the controller. So normally I'm a, like a flick shot sniper, you know, like I actually like just flick to the target and then snipe um, Halo Infinite. It's just like there was like either a huge delay or it's just their dead zones are completely wrong yeah. to where you could initiate the movement with the sniper. So it was just like way too difficult to actually land your shots i i felt myself like forcing the stick all the way to the outside to actually get the the movement yeah. and then even then um the the aiming was still off and i like to compare it to current mcc so mcc i keep my horizontal and vertical settings the exact same yeah. so i play on like four four you know Halo, um, Halo five. If you look at it, the, um, horizontal is like for four controller settings, your horizontal is two and your vertical is four. So two, four is way different than, you know, four, four. And then if you make it like the same horizontal and vertical on Halo five, it feels completely off. Mm. Well, the, the standard I tried going off of MCCs. For Halo Infinite and doing, um, I was on like four four, and then that felt off. So I tried doing like six six. That felt super off. And then I did like four horizontal and six vertical, and that actually kind of felt like normal. And then yeah. I looked at some of the pros, and they were talking about how they had to put their vertical like way up mm. just to feel normal. And I'm hoping that they fix their aiming system <laughs> and not make it like Halo 5 again, because I feel like we're probably just going to get like heavy aim and all the other nonsense that came with it. I hope they go back to like MCC style aiming. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 been, a, it's been a headache thinking about it, because like my, my main tweet I tweeted before the, the Halo Infinite tech preview was all I want to do in the tech preview is establish a sensitivity and an aim. And I felt like it was a disaster for a aiming. Do, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's good because I preface that with the fact that I'm all for skill gap, like a bit large skill gap. So if it's harder to aim, um, I think like that's fine. But what you're saying there is that it's not so much that it's hard to aim. It's just that it doesn't, there's not really much sense. Like there's no logic to how hard it is to aim. So it's hard for like, even if you're a really yeah. talented player, it's hard to kind of get the idea of, okay, this is how I'm going to be shooting because it's, it, there's, it, there's no logical way. Like you said, if you've got to have a vertical look sense much higher than a horizontal look sense, there's not really any logical reason for that. Right. Right. And yeah, still, exactly. And then if that feels different between weapons as well, that's another thing that'll just like throw people. Cause they'll be like, well, you know, am I going to be trying to run and pick up a sniper in the game? And if that's the case, then I have to play with my sniper sense and get used to shooting with that when I'm using the BR or mm. what the mainstream weapons are. And so that, I think all of that just makes it super confusing. You know, it needs to be super simple, but still have an element of that, yeah. that skill gap there. Um, how did you find things? I, uh, that- Sorry, what were you going to say? What, what what I did really like, though, I will say this, is that there was way less like aim assist and bullet magnetism, which was just fantastic. And that is the element of the skill gap that Halo Infinite is bringing to the table. And I think that if they get the, the controller settings and stuff 
like more in line, then, you know, that skill gap will really show and, you know, people will be able to aim consistently. And so they could actually land those shots and stuff. Yeah. So the skill gap is definitely going to be there. Cause like I said, there's like way less aim assist and bullet magnetism than there ever has been. So yeah. Yeah. That's a, which, that's a good thing. Yeah. Which I'm so okay with. Um, there's so, there's so many times where like, especially in, in games like Halo five, where I'll, I'll get out, out shot by someone and I'll just, and I don't know, was that me? Was that the game? Was that the magnetism? <laughs> yeah. Like how many areas, like what percentage right there, if that fight happens every time, but with a slight variance, like it's my host or it's this, do I win that fight? You know what I mean? Yeah. Just don't even change how I shot, just the exact situation, but we just change a few things. And that's what I, I'm hoping for in Halo Infinite, right? Is that it's yeah. it's more obvious that the better player wins more times than not. You know? Right, for sure. Without yeah. a doubt. An element of randomness. How did you feel about, um, there was like people were concerned about, you know, picking up and holding um, active camo and overshield. How do you feel like that kind of played? Uh, I think it actually played pretty well um, because, you know, if you're carrying it around, you don't use it, you could potentially lose it. Mm -hmm. um, that's always cool. Um, and the fact that, like, when you use cam camo, like, camo is so short in Halo Infinite that, you know, you're going to have to use it at a good time to when you know you can actually utilize the camo. And same with overshield. Like, the overshield depletes so quickly yeah, that you're going to need to use it when you know you're about to initiate a fight or like you take two shots, you take cover and then you initiate your overshield to finish the fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it like Halo three, you know, you could sit next to overshield, get shot at a couple times and wait for like somebody to be pushing at you, then step on overshield, pick it up and then, you know, abuse like the overshield as it's charging and stuff like that. So I think it's I think it's way better so that way you can actually like move about the map and like position yourself strategically to then use it and utilize the power up. Yeah, yeah. I, and look, one of the big things that I loved about Halo 3, I think we lost in other Halos in the competitive scene was um, how much it was about teamwork and team pushes for, for things. And I think that adds another thing to it, right? Is if you pick up overshield and then a sniper's coming up in a minute, you could use that overshield to make a better sniper push. So it makes right, it more yeah, difficult sure. to have either of the two things, you know, and it kind mm -hmm. of, it shapes the way that the game's going to play. It gives it a, a, like a, a little bit more, another dimension that you have to consider, like at that competitive aspect, right? Is right. Do, like we didn't get overshield, but they've got overshield. They've still got overshield, you know, they haven't used it. So when we make this push for sniper, we can't be too aggressive because then they're going to, you know, like it just adds that extra thought process that the whole team has to go through. So yeah, I was excited about that. What do you think about uh, the Gravity Hammer? <laughs> the Gravity Hammer is a lot of fun. Uh, it's it plays pretty pretty crazy with the uh, the explosion on it. Mm. Um, it kind of like plays different than the other Halos. I I had a ton of fun with it. If you kill two people at once with it, you get a Grand Slam medal, which I mm. thought was hilarious. Yeah. Um, and then there was a, also another part with the Gravity Hammer with the where the bots actually grappled at me like yeah. it grappled me and was flying at me with the hammer and i was just terrified yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was pretty sweet i like the gravity hammer i don't know i don't think it'll be in competitive settings but i think that they definitely made it like really fun to use yeah yeah well yeah because i mean it's the type of thing that on a lot of maps in previous halos i wouldn't even go i wouldn't even bother about it but I was so interested right. to use it from just seeing it in like other people's gameplays and, you know, on, on Instagram mm -hmm. and Twitter. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to give this a go. And I thought that I liked that there was a slight delay, but then there was a little bit more of that like explosion of the hammer hitting um, than there has been. I really, I thought that I liked the twist on that. Um, I didn't get to use the grapple hook much, but it felt like um, it was a little bit like, it needs like three uses and then a recharge period or something like that. Cause I felt like I was just flying around with it, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. Um, so I like to compare it to the, uh, did you ever play much apex legends? Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So pathfinders grapple hook, the mechanics are almost like the same yeah. for the grapple, the grapple. So you could like grapple like underneath a ledge and then launch yourself like Sweet. around it straight up into the air and then you could make like a crazy play 
yeah. which I was trying to do stuff like that for fun. And I did like a grapple hook 360 rocket, which was pretty fun. And I ended up getting a triple kill and then I suicided for the overkill. So I didn't get the official overkill, but it was, it was really fun. So it's just like really fun to mess around with. Like it's a really cool, fun, uh, fun uh, ability, if you will. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. It's good. I'm glad that they brought it back in. I'm glad that it's not like everybody has it. What did you think about like the general movement as far as like sprinting and, you know, jumping and clambering and everything like that? Was it what you're expecting or do you think it needs some tweaks still? I think it was pretty much what I was expecting. Um, the sprint honestly isn't too fast to where, you know, it seems like it's like a, a super powerful thing. I think they put, brought good balance to how fast you move with it. Um, the one thing that I have been seeing a lot of is the, um, like the sliding mechanics, mm -hmm. you know, you're able to like slide on certain surfaces and like launch yourself again, kind of similar to like Halo five. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of Halo five's lifespan, you could sprint at, um, a ramp and then thrust slide and you would literally just stick to the slide and you could just launch off of it. Yeah. And it kind of makes me think of that um, because they ended up like nerfing that and taking that away from Halo 5. I feel like the current slide mechanics in Infinite kind of play similar to that. And I'm hoping that they kind of dial back the, the sliding off ramps yeah. in Halo Infinite because I, I would like Halo Infinite to have more of that classical movement to where you know it's going to be like predictable and you're not going to have someone just like psycho sliding across the map off of a ramp you know what i mean yeah yeah for sure i noticed that as well just even with like the strafing when you're watching like two players fighting the like the, the how fast the actual like strafe is and then if you add a um uh, a crouch into it the crouch was a, a significant strafe as well um uh, which mm -hmm. In Halo 5, a lot of people use it as well, but in Halo 5, it was more just like smash it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like a strafe, 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 and then you add in a, a duck and it's like a really big difference to like what's going on. Like I, I thought of it as it's like the thrust of Halo Infinite is, this, is, the, is the crouch in the <laughs> Yeah. Because it, it's such a big variance, right? Like it's not like the bullets will hit you. If you duck and they're at head height, they're going to miss. Like it's a big, it's a big difference. Right, um, especially if you don't have a high vertical sensitivity, so you can't bring your cursor down quick enough or whatever to actually get that shot on them. Yeah, yeah. But all in all, happy with uh, with most of the stuff that we saw from Halo Infinite? Oh, yeah. I'm very happy and I'm very excited too because I do believe that like this is what's going to put Halo back on the map again. Yeah. Um, just with the arena style. And I just hope that they, you know, take some feedback, like constructive feedback and, uh, and work on it. Like the bizarre map, I feel like it needs maybe some more ledges or something. So that way the map just flows better and you're not just like stuck on certain like elevations. Yeah. Um, so I feel like they could just add a few things and tweak the maps a little bit to make them play better. But other than that, I think that we're we're pretty well set up for for a good future with uh halo and esports and everything so i'm very excited for yeah. halo infinite i can't wait to see i can't wait to see how it all pans out um well let, let's get back to a little bit more about like yourself right because we talked about you're kind of coming up through halo um what was it about 2015 or when did you get into the content creation side of things so content creation i started um i believe it was like 2015 2013 is when I actually started. So it's been like eight years or so now. Um, that's when I actually like created my account, everything on Twitch. And then I started like dabbling with content creation. Um, back then I was playing um, Smite was mm -hmm. the game that I was playing. So I wanted to like stream that and just, you know, kind of play and then just to kind of meet people within the community and everything like that. And then from there, you know, that was 2013. So when MCC came out, I was like, ooh, it's Halo time again. And so that's when I started streaming just Halo. And then, like, it's been Halo pretty much ever since. So, yeah, started about eight years ago. I've been streaming on Twitch. Yeah, that's awesome. And because uh, I noticed I've watched quite a few of your YouTube videos as well. 
when did the YouTube side of things come onto it? I think my first YouTube post was maybe 2015. And honestly, I wasn't even trying to do anything with YouTube until this past, um, the past like two years, you know, when the, when the pandemic happened, everything, I was like, all right, I need to like focus on content creation and just post on YouTube and just be super consistent with Twitch. So I didn't even mess with uh, YouTube until about uh, like a year and a half ago. Yeah. Do you have, um, do you have, did it have, did you have anyone that kind of like inspired you when you were getting into it or was it something that you just did, like you said, just to meet some more people and become a, more of a part of the community and that in Smite? Um, so when I first initially started streaming, uh, it was just kind of, you know, I would get on Twitch and I think Lyric was the one that I watched a lot, um, because he was like one of the first people to do it and he was like super popular. And so I feel like he kind of inspired me. Yeah. Um, so that was like at the very beginning. And then I started meeting people in the Smite community, like Lasses. He still streams to this day and he's a very popular streamer, but I used to like be really high up and ranked on Smite. So I would play with him and I was very inspired by him as well to just get better at the game and, uh, you know, meet people within the Smite community and stuff. So that was really cool. Yeah. So he definitely inspired me. Yeah. And so what's, what's like the, the goal for you with, um, with streaming and content creation? Like, is this something that you want to be like, actually, is it, is it your full-time thing at the moment or is it something that you're trying to like get to that point where it's your full-time gig? So it, it currently is full-time. Uh, it, it's literally what I do every single day as like my, uh, job, if you will. Um, but you know, it doesn't bring in a ton of money as like the only thing that's monetizable at the moment is just Twitch. Mm -hmm. so trying to just grow everything and you know get to the point where can sustain you know family and stuff like that with it would be the ultimate goal yeah and then you know my wife and i were kind of talking about it last night We're like we don't want to like be like ninja status because <laughs> that's just like way too much money and like fame and yeah we don't really need all that because we're just like super chill people. So, yeah, you know, just enough to, you know, support the family and, you know, prepare us for the future and everything. So, yeah, for sure. And because you've got a, a little one as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. I've got a five year old daughter. She's about to start kindergarten in two weeks. So that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's just my wife and my daughter. My wife and I have been married for like eight years now. Yeah. So, yeah just family man <laughs> yeah for sure uh well i liked that about your stream i felt like it was a very like family friendly kind of stream as well you know what i mean like it was it was nice hanging out there and there was no like toxic elements to it or anything like that which was great um so okay content creation is gonna be the full-time thing so at the moment you're streaming and you've got youtube is it are you using tiktok or twitter or anything else as well so Twitter is like my main social media platform that I use um, where I post like all my like content and updates and everything. And then I've also got like my Discord community. I'm trying to grow TikTok and Instagram and stuff like that. But those platforms, I don't know why those seem so difficult to grow. Like I... I call myself a boomer because I'm 29 and I just like can't understand the uh, Zoomer yeah. uh, mentality of like creating content around TikTok and stuff like that. Like I see other people doing it and I'm like, wow, that looks really good. But I am editing all my own stuff. So I don't really I'm like not at that level yet. So. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Well, um, you should watch the podcast with Remy with Min Blitz because he's talked about like how he's doing his content and because he's mm. across multiple platforms now. And I think it, most of his are between like 15 and, and 30K, most of his platforms, right? Um, with obviously his YouTube's over 100K. And uh, yeah. he, he gave some really good insight on okay. how he does his stuff. But I think it's definitely worth looking into because um, like I Instagram, I get Instagram. TikTok, I get it. It's just that it's with TikTok and Instagram, it takes so much time because it is, you've got to be posting regularly. And the, yeah. the app, 
it is going to show you to more people if you keep more people on the app. Like that's the easiest way to think about it, right? So like if, I post, sense, yeah. if I post like a 60 second video to Instagram or um, an IGTV uh, episode and it's 10 minutes long and a uh, thousand people watch it and out of those thousand people, 500 of them watch it the whole way through then Instagram is going to love that and it's going to show it to other people that look for Halo content to similar content and it's going to thrust it in front of them and it's going to skyrocket the amount of people that see it. With Instagram, it's hard because those things can happen and there's not a clear way for people to follow it. So a lot of the way that like Instagram will work is like if somebody sh is shouting you out or if someone's commenting and to, or if you're commenting on someone's posts, like that's how that kind of thing will really happen. Um, whereas TikTok is... If you're posting something that someone watches the whole way through and then it's got like a hierarchy of the uh, like liking, commenting, sharing, that type of stuff. Um, if someone watches it the whole way through, that's the most vital thing they can do for your video. Uh, if they mm -hmm. share it, that's the second best thing that they can do. If they comment on it and then if they like. And if you look at those things, it's because each of those things means that there's more attention going to that particular video um, and, and it's the longest form of attention that's most important. So watching right. the whole thing is the longest. It takes you the longest to watch it, right? Sending it to someone takes the next longest. Commenting, depending on how long the comment is, is the next one. Liking it is super simple. And so that's what that's what like TikTok wants to see. And uh, But because of that, it is a really easy thing to do if you've got like a group of people, like say your audience right now, if they knew mm -hmm. that you were trying to grow that aspect of, of what you're doing and you had something like your Discord, we said to everybody, Okay, how many people are live in my Discord right now? I've got 60 people live in my Discord. I'm going to post a TikTok video. And in that first five minutes that you post a, a, TikTok, a TikTok, 60 people go on and just watch it through a bunch of times, comment on it, refer, like share it to each other, you know, that type yeah. of stuff. You can actually manufacture a, a significant following just from that because then it's going to put you in front of other random people on their, on their feeds um, just, and that'll be organic from that point on. So yeah, it's, um, that's it's crazy. Hard, yeah, it's hard to get the ball rolling, but once it's rolling, it uh, it should be easier to build those things, you know. And yeah, I've I've been messing with uh, YouTube Shorts a lot, and YouTube Shorts pretty much works the same way as you were just describing TikTok. You know, the more people that like the video and actually watch it all the way through, it just pushes it to more people. So like my YouTube Shorts like gain the most attention on my YouTube right now because yeah. my long form content. I'm getting like, you know, between 15 and like 50 views, but then my YouTube shorts are like pushing over a thousand. Yeah. For and sure. it's just, it's crazy. And it's just because people are liking the content and then, you know, I don't know if they're sharing it or whatever, but yeah, yeah, yeah. it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Well, I, I, lo I love looking at all that type of stuff because it's like, all it's a really, that mar that's like a form of marketing that's really important to personal branding, you know, and uh, mm. it's really interesting to see, but um yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to link all your stuff below. So if anyone that's listening is curious, you should definitely go and check it out. Um, I love just looking into it as well. So I'm going to look through your stuff as well, see if there's anything we can do. If you've got some Halo stuff posted on your Instagram, we'll definitely share it and, and make sure that people can kind of see it as well. We're just we're coming up on 3,000 on our main in, uh, Instagram, the Divine Mind, which is like the Halo oh, wow. stuff. So, um, but like, again, it's the attention that I look at. I don't really look at the followers as much. We've got uh, about... Um, anywhere between 150 and 300,000 uh, impressions like every few days on Instagram. So that's what I want. I want to, I want that to be as high as possible because then more people are seeing us. Right. I don't really care about the people right. following it. That's what I right. know about it. Right. So, <laughs> right. So like, uh, I have a question then regarding that. Um, sure. I, again, I'm a boomer, don't understand Instagram and stuff like that. So what kind of content do you guys like try to post on there? Like what do, what do people engage with the most? Is it like videos? Like as a content creator, should I be posting videos on mm -hmm. like different things with Halo or do I post pictures or? Well, it, it's first of all, the, the, the answer to that question is you just should be posting more. Like that, like honestly, and then you get to see what your audience is going to react to better. And then that's what you post more of. So like, so a good way to look at that is if you're only posting like once or twice a week right now, and it's all just Halo clips, then it'd be a good way to change it up would be to post, you know, a, a picture, an image that's maybe to do with like your family. Um, if that's an element of like what you're trying to share with your audience. 
And then like another right. part would be, you know, like a halo clip and then post them all at the same time and get a good understanding for like, you know, what, and what is the reaction that I'm getting for each of those? Um, and then post more of the one that is the most successful. Right. Um, right. but to answer your question directly, we found that, uh, like the memes were are definitely what gets the most <laughs> engagement for us. And it's no, it's, it's serious. Like that's literally what gets the most. So, uh, like nine posts out of 10 will be memes. One will be a halo clip. And then one, we're making sure that we share content that's like um, one of somebody who associates themselves with Divine Mind, regardless of what it okay. is. So, right. um, yeah, but that's also like I've been doing it now for about two years and just check and just checking what works. Um, and again, we talked about I talked about it with Remy is like you're, you you got to think about like you're trying to when you're trying to build an audience, you don't necessarily need to build your audience around what you want the outcome to be at the end. So like at the end of this, we don't want, you know, when we've got a team competing at events and when we, you know, have got merch that we're trying to sell, we don't want to be posting memes because it's, it's not going to help the business, the business side of us at all. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. But if we <laughs> develop this audience of 10,000 people that like Halo content and uh, then we start posting about our team and about the merch, there's going to be in that 10,000 people, a much higher level of like, um, you know, interested people in in our content it might not get the same like you know it might not get you know some of our memes get over ten thousand likes and we've only got you know 2800 2900 people following us right right um <laughs> it's about getting to the point where we have ten thousand people following us and then 2800 people clicking the link to buy something you know so right for sure and, and so like it's the same thing for you and like with your branding and what you're trying to do is like that's what i, I would say is just find the stuff that you can post that's going to get you to get you to where you want to be the fastest and then you change the content to what you want to post that is either going to directly influence your branding and what you're trying to build there or what's going to help you make more money so that you can afford to upgrade your setup or go to an event or do something else that's going to help with it as well, right? So right. That, would be, that would be like my advice for, for Instagram anyway. So <laughs> That's awesome. That's really good insight, to be honest, because yeah. like, like I said, I don't really mess around with Instagram a whole lot. And pretty much I actually just like offloaded my Instagram to my wife. I mm. said, you know, what? It, you know about Instagram. And so she kind of like runs my Instagram and like posts on my stories and stuff. And she's like organized it really well. Yeah. And I guess we just got to get more content going on there because um, mostly we just kind of like post to this story. Yeah. And I feel like stories don't really do much for engagement or interaction or anything like that. Just because that only goes to like your followers really. Right. Yeah. So to engage with more, you just got to post more. I got you. Post more, use different hashtags. And then just what there's an, in, if you know, if you if your account's not set on a business profile, set it to a business profile so you can see all the insights. And then like after a week, go and look at the insights and be like, okay, so, you know, this many people liked it there. And that was generally in the first like 24 hours of the of it being up and then it faded. Right. So mm. like, was it a relevant post? And that's why people liked it. Or was it because you've got a core audience that are like looking for your posts and they liked it and then it dropped off because new people were seeing it that aren't part of your audience and it didn't appeal to them? Like you can start telling a story around the statistics. So then like the next post, it might be something that you think would appear to a broader range of people and see if that does more consistently over a longer period of time. You know, like that's the type of stuff that I'd be looking at to get to be able to tell a story of like what we should be doing. Um, but like, you know, when I'm really, when I've got the time and I'm really trying to grow it, I'll post four or five times a day and, uh, and, and I'll be like liking and commenting on as many people's posts as I can. I've got notifications turned on so that whenever Remy posts, whenever, um, some of the really big, um, guys on Instagram posts, I get a notification and I'm one of the first people that comments on their posts, like, like 80% of the time. And that means that anyone that sees wow. their post sees my comment. And so like, you know, subconsciously, but eventually consciously they go, Oh, there's that divine mind account again. And they click in it and they, and they look at what we're doing. Oh, it's Halo content. Just like I was looking at then I'll give them a follow. So like, right. You know, that's okay. a of, like that's a little stuff that you can do that'll help. And it, but it's just about being consistent with it. You know what I mean? Like, right. For sure. And, and, and it definitely builds up. Um, and also like, you've got a great following and a great community. It would be like saying to everyone, yeah. hey, I'm going to put in, I'm going to try to make this a priority for me right now. I would love it if you guys want to support me on that over there. You know what I mean? Like, right. You know, for sure. You, you interacting with that helps me a lot. 
and uh, and that'll get you off flying. But you should definitely, you know, we've got a, I don't know if, have you ever heard of Didact before? He's a, a mm-hmm. content creator. I'm going to link you his stuff, right? He is um, been going for just over a year now creating content. And he's been like working with us since like October last year. No, he's been with us since like three months in. He's one of the first people that ever said, can I be a part of Divine Mind? And uh, I've been talking to him about stuff. He does a lot of his own development. And this kid, this guy is, you know, he's the same age as you. Um, and, uh, you know, he works really hard on improving his content. And like, we're super proud of everything that he's doing. But he, he'd be a good person for you to talk to and maybe even work a little bit with where you could like both create content that would benefit each other. Um, and also you get like his, his YouTube shorts at the moment are just killing it. He got something like 70 followers, new followers on YouTube in 24 hours the other day. Cause he just hit a halo infinite uh, wow. video just on point. It was like the fresh Prince of Bel-Air dance. And he just put the helmet, the um, Spartan helmet over the top of it with halo music in the background. That's it. But like wow. it, did it at the right time, put it out there, 70 new followers on, on YouTube, you know? So like those, wow. are, it's, it's good to have people like that in your network you know, cause they'll, that kind of keeps you motivated and going, Oh, I should try this as well. I like that, you know? So Right. Yeah, for fun. sure. But uh, outside, I want to talk more about you again as well. So when you're streaming, how, what's your general um, like audience? How many people do you have watching you when you're, when you're live? Uh, I think average viewership is like 25. Um, but I only look at post stream statistics. I don't actually look at any of my stats while I'm live mm-hmm. um, because it's like, subconscious i'd always like think about numbers and be like oh am i doing did i do something wrong that like forced people out of my stream and to go somewhere else but uh i don't like to think that way so you know i just like to do my thing and i like to just enjoy you know streaming and i'm gonna just do my thing no matter what and if people don't like it or they want to go somewhere else or whatever um then you know it's up to them but the general vibe and everything is just like, keep a positive attitude, keep a positive vibe and try to, you know, make people happy and um, just have like a general good environment to be around, you know, because I know that I personally need that for myself. Like I need the good environment because I do suffer with depression and stuff like that. So it's like, I need that that good vibes and the good energy and like, I need positive people in my chat that are always like reinforcing and like motivating. And, and I try to do that back for them. So that way we can all just, you know, have a really good time and enjoy the five hours that I'm live every day. Yeah. Awesome, man. <laughs> I love that. It sounds like you've put a lot of thought into the way that you want your community to be and, and the type of mm-hmm. space you're trying to create for other people to come in and enjoy as well. Right. Yeah. So that's why I, uh, I went with family friendly because, you know, I have my five-year-old daughter and I like to make it so, you know, I'm not swearing or anything like that because my daughter does watch my stream. Yeah. So they'll, they'll have the stream on in the living room or whatever. And, um, you know, so I don't swear. I don't like do any kind of, you know, weird comments, nothing toxic. Like, like I said, just good vibes because just being toxic and stuff like that is not good. Like, for mental health reasons for literally anyone. Like it's just so much easier to be nice and to yeah. be kind and like compliment people rather than try and tear them down, you know? So. And it's better for the Halo community as a whole. And that's ultimately what we want. We want more people playing Halo, <laughs> right? Right, exactly. Yeah, we don't want to like tell people that they stink at the game. Like obviously people are trying to improve and or they're just trying to have fun, you know? Yeah, So for sure. Well, it's been awesome talking to you so far, man. Like, uh, I, I, lo- I love everything that you're doing and I want you to have the success. And I think that you're the type of person that, you know, you're working hard at it, so you're going to, you know. Um, when, when we talk about you, like, off, off screen, like, off out of the content, uh, obviously, we, we kind of said when we first started that you're, you know, you're a husband and a father as well. Um, did you go to university, mm-hmm. you know, before you started streaming? Were you working? Were you doing full-time stuff? Like, Give us a little bit of you outside of the, the stream. So outside of stream, um, present time, I'm pretty much just focusing on content and then being a, a father and a good husband. I mean, that's pretty much it. Like we moved from Michigan to South Carolina. So now I'm pretty much outdoors, like all the time, whenever I can. Yeah. <laughs> so my daughter and I, we go to the pool, we hang out there. That's pretty much 
mainly what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to get super tan. Yeah. Um, but um, like I said, I'm just hanging out with my daughter, hanging out with my wife. Um, I didn't go to college or anything. Out of high school, I started working as hard as I could. Um, I started a career at UPS. So I was in the package industry. Um, and then I was streaming. So I was part time there. And then I was streaming when I got done with that. And uh, I was doing really well with that in like 2015. And then um, 2016 is when my daughter was born. And then I just kind of, you know, stepped back from streaming completely and uh, focused on being, you know, a dad and everything. And then just leading up till now, I've just been working. And since we moved down here, I just said, you know, well, actually, when COVID happened, I said, you know, I want to focus full time on content creation and like, this is what I want to do. So I haven't been working um, an actual job other than like door dashing for extra money. Yeah. So just, uh, you know, I still do that now just to make ends meet and everything because, you know, content creation doesn't make a ton of money. So yeah. <laughs> door dashing on the side to uh, make ends meet and everything. So that's pretty much where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, what about like the, you've mentioned the outside a lot, health and fitness. Is that something that's like important to you? Do you, I know we're talking before we started and I, and I got mm-hmm. some girls, hey, you know, you've got people making you do push-ups. I think, I think the day that I was in there, I think you did like over 200 push-ups <laughs> in your stream. Yeah. So I, uh, I have channel point redemptions for my Twitch streams. So if you watch the stream, you gain channel points and then, so like 5,000 channel points right now, you can make me do 10 pushups. Mm. And then um, on, I do tank top Tuesdays where I wear a tank top and then I do half off pushups on that day. So yeah, the day that you were there, I think I did around 210 total pushups that wow. day because it was half off pushups and everything and people were going crazy with it. So yeah, I, uh, I love... I love the feeling of like working out and stuff. Uh, do you know Peloton? Yep. Like yeah. Peloton bikes. I have a Peloton bike right over there. Um, I, I love riding that thing. They're super motivational and stuff on like the, the Peloton, like the yeah. people that are the instructors. Yeah. So I love that. And then like I said, the pool, hmm. I love uh, just swimming in the pool because it's yeah. really easy on your joints and everything. Definitely. So I like to try and, you know, get a workout um, just swimming and stuff. And then, uh, other than that, I have my bike. I love biking. So yeah, that's pretty much all the fitness stuff that I do. I, I, I think it's really important to, uh, to take care of your body, you know? Yeah. Like they say, you, your body is your temple. Like you need to take care of it. Like that's, that's you, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's the only thing you got. All right. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we were talking about before we started the stream as well, uh, we're obviously doing our movement challenge for divine mind this month. Uh, and so like I encourage anyone that watches this, uh, during the month of August, uh, if you go for a run, a walk, a swim, a kayak, a bike ride, whatever, and you can chuck on something like Strava or just an app that kind of tracks the run. Um, if you send me just a, a quick little screenshot of that activity, you'll be contributing to, uh, what divine minds mission is, which is kind of changing those negative stereotypes around gamers, making it a more positive place to be a more healthy place. Um, so, and I'd love it. Same thing for you. If you want to, uh, next time that you go for a walk or a ride or something, you know, track it and then tweet it at us and, and we'll try and get even more people going. Cause I think it's such a simple thing to do, you know, just get up and move a little bit more, but the impact that it can yeah, have, sure. on, you know, the, uh, I like to think that like movement creates momentum. And, uh, like if you're trying to create more momentum in your business, in your, you know, in your relationship and whatever it is that you're doing, the best thing you can do is just get up and start moving. You know, because that movement Mm -hmm. gets momentum flowing. You'll have time to think. You'll come up with better ideas. You know, you'll start feeling healthier and more confident in yourself. And all of those things will help you to become become a better version of of whatever it is that you're trying to do. So it'd be good to anyone watching this, including yourself, (laughs) you know, um, have have a crack. You know, it's like it doesn't need to be a thousand kilometers. It doesn't need to be whatever. We've got um, Fireboy, who I'm super proud of him. He's been working with us for since October last year. He's lost over 20 kilos doing the Divine Mind workouts and going to the gym himself and putting a big effort That's into awesome. it. That's awesome. Yeah, and he's, he's a 16-year-old kid, you know, and he's he's already uh, started going for runs every morning just to add some kilometers to it and be a part of that that movement. So 
you know, I think all of that stuff's again, it's that positive, good vibes community. It's healthy. You know, it's really, it's, it's going to be a better place for gamers to be in the long run. So, um, yeah, exactly. And like you said, just get up and do it. Cause you know, a body in motion stays in motion. You know, if you're just sitting on the couch and you don't want to do anything, you're probably not going to do anything. So, yeah. but if you get up and you start moving around, you start getting active and you just want to do more. Yeah. It's like when you start cleaning and then you, you start in one area, well, you're not just going to like stop cleaning all of a sudden, <laughs> you're just going to keep going, you know, it's just done. keep going until you're done. Yeah, for sure. I, I, always, I always use that um, scenario for any of the young kids that we talk to. It's like, if you're feeling stuck, or you can't come up with ideas, clean your room. And they're like, what? I'm like, no, seriously, just clean your room, change it up. You know, if you're going to do some washing, do some washing, vacuum, clean your room. And that little bit of momentum will make you feel so much better because you'll have a clean space where you're spending the majority of your time gaming if that's if that's where you game, you know, and you'll mm. have plenty of time while you're cleaning where you'll think of ideas and stuff you'd rather be doing than cleaning. So by the time you finish cleaning, you go straight back and, and you know, have some um, momentum to go. So, um, yeah. yeah, I think that's super important. But um, that's that's pretty much all we've got time for. Unfortunately, an hour isn't uh, isn't long enough some, for <laughs> you to be able to get through everything I'm sure we want to talk about. But uh, like sure. I said, everybody, we'll touch base once Infinite's out and we'll have a bit of time to talk about the type of content that you're creating there and the change you've seen and, you know, how many more viewers you've got because of a, a you know, active, alive game with a large viewer. Base. <laughs> right. <laughs> and not just Halo 5, you know. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, but again, for everyone that's watched the podcast up until this point, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your viewership and, and just sticking around for the journey to see what we do all of uh crazy miller's links will be in the description to the video or in the description to the podcast so make sure you have a look and go and support some of his content let him know that you heard you came from here as well so he can he knows that people enjoyed the podcast and hearing everything about him um and yeah make sure that you, you should support him as much as possible in his endeavors uh is there anything else you want to chat about or mention before we finish up I just want to say thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. You've been wonderful. And uh, I look forward to uh, chatting with you and working with you in the future, man. Of it's course. been awesome. And uh, like I said earlier, just uh, stay positive, everybody. Yeah. Let's try to motivate others and bring people up and uh, be active and just enjoy life because uh, life is short, man. Yeah. Here, here. I agree with that as well. So thanks, guys. To see everybody on the next episode of the podcast. All right.